Hello, this is the second in the series, Tears for Trans. In part one, we took a look at how transgender issues manifests in popular culture, and how it's often presented to children and concerned parents. In this video, we shall take an historical perspective to see if we can identify key players, and perhaps to gain at least a basic understanding of how we arrived at where we are. Obviously, in this format, there is a constraint on time. We can only take a very simplified overview, but I want us to at least touch on all the significant points, and to gain some insight into the main players, some of whom you've probably heard of, but some are not so famous. But each one, in my opinion, is equally important to the story. There are three main characters, Kinsey, Benjamin, and Money. I've heard this group of individuals described as the Three Musketeers. That's not a bad description. Our story starts in 1947, when Alfred Kinsey established the Kinsey Institute in Indiana in the US. Kinsey was an entomologist. An entomologist, if you're not familiar with the term, is someone who studies insects. So although he was a biologist, he was not a physician or a psychologist. If you were to be flippant, you might claim that he knew more about the bees than the birds. However, he was a very good biologist, and his textbook on biology became the standard text used in schools throughout the US. It was highly praised and innovative at the time. His reputation as a biologist and an educator was well earned. However, most people know Kinsey from his work at the institute he founded and his books on human sexuality, which became known as the Kinsey Reports. One book focused on male sexuality, and the other on female sexuality. We might be conflicted about the nature of his work, but to be honest, something along these lines was desperately needed. We knew virtually nothing about these topics, and we forget today how controversial it was in those days to even ponder such matters, let alone engage in serious research. But there are serious issues relating to his work, apart from the sensitivity of the subject being researched. These concerns relate to methodology, rigour, and even scientific integrity. We only have time to look at a single example, but it is extremely telling, and not untypical of the quality of the work published by Kinsey. This relates to his book on male sexuality, within which he presents a section on prepubescent orgasm. The data appears in tables 30 to 34 of the book. The tables purport to show 300 observations. These observations were said to have come from adults' childhood memories. Kinsey also claimed in that section that he also interviewed nine men who had had sexual experience with children. Years later, when pressed on the topic, the Kinsey Institute said that the data on children in these tables came from a single individual. The entire section was a fabrication. Our next protagonist is Harry Benjamin, who was a German-American general practitioner who started his first practice in New York and later opened another practice in San Francisco, later to be described as an endocrinologist and sexologist. Benjamin became known for his clinical work relating to transsexualism. He became involved in the field after Benjamin was asked by Kinsey to take on a case in 1947, which involved a male who wanted to become a girl. Now, a word of caution here, because the Wikipedia entries are often inaccurate on these topics. The Wikipedia describes the patient as a child, but the case notes describe him as an adult male who was 23 years old at the time. There is also evidence that this was not his first transsexual patient. We shall set that to one side. This particular case, it seems, led Benjamin to understand that he was dealing with a different condition to that of transvestitism. He was later to publish the book The Transsexual Phenomenon in 1966. It was the first work describing the affirmative treatment path which he pioneered. This case was the first case that I could find that involved the use of estrogen and surgical intervention. The intervention was carried out in Denmark due to legal issues. Such interventions would have been illegal in the United States at the time. You could lobotomize patients, but castrating them was normally frowned on. So Kinsey and Benjamin were quite friendly, 
not only communicating, but Kinsey was also recommending patients to Benjamin's practice for treatment. It is at this stage that we shall take a look at a less well-known side player, because he also has a role to play, particularly in relation to advocacy and funding. He was also a patient of Harry Benjamin. Enter stage left, Reed Erickson, who was born of a well-to-do family as a girl named Rita Erickson. After his father's death in 1962, Erickson inherited a major interest in the family enterprises, and after some very canny investments became quite wealthy. He diverted some of this into his own interests and advocacy. The most notable for our story is the establishment of the Erickson Educational Foundation, the EEF, funded almost every aspect of work being done in the 1960s and the 1970s in the field of transsexualism, in the US and to a lesser degree in other countries. The EEF funded many early research efforts, including the creation of the Harry Benjamin Foundation. As a side note, it also funded other areas of interest to Ericsson, such as various New Age movement projects, such as the first edition of The Course in Miracles. It also advocated for acupuncture, homeopathy and dream research, and dolphin communication studies. However, our main focus is in his significant contribution through the EEF, relating to transsexualism. The EEF produced a wealth of materials aimed at influencing medical, social and law enforcement professionals. In many ways, it was a successful enterprise that would be the template for later advocacy groups and organisations. The central tenets propagated by the EEF rested heavily on the studies of Kinsey and the clinical practices pioneered by Benjamin. The problem is that Kinsey's studies are flawed and Benjamin's scientific methodology non-existent. Benjamin's methodology can be summarised as let's do X and see what happens. For instance, nothing is known in relation to the ultimate fate of patient zero in this drama. What happened to the patient referred to Harry Benjamin by Kinsey? This patient was central to the development of the affirmation path intervention. Does anyone wonder? I do. Does anyone know? Apparently not. The next player we shall consider is John Money, who was a psychologist who joined the John Hopkins faculty in 1951. He trained as a clinical psychologist at Harvard. John Money is often called the father of gender, because in the 1960s, he introduced the term gender as a psychological concept. Before that, its use was strictly grammatical. Money also proposed and developed several theories that related to terminology along the same lines, such as gender identity and gender role. These terms soon started to appear in the literature and are still with us today. There are many controversies surrounding John Money. The most famous is the John Joan case, where Money reported that a patient's transition from male to female was an unmitigated success. Money had reported the patient's progress over some time, and always betrayed it as a successful male-female reassignment, despite indications to the contrary. This case study was used to support the feasibility of sex reassignment and surgical reconstruction even in non-intersex cases. The controversy came to a head when an academic sexologist persuaded the patient to allow him to report the outcome in order to dissuade physicians from treating other infants in the same way. This became known as the David Riemer case. The case did not have a happy ending. Eventually, David switched back to male, but eventually took his own life. Worse, his twin suffered deep psychological issues, thought to have been aggravated by his involvement in therapy sessions conducted by money. When interviewed later, both boys' accounts of these therapies did not match the case notes made by money at the time. A link to a detailed account of the case will be in the description box below. Another controversial case that involved money was that of Tabitha. While this case might seem less dramatic, and its conclusion positive rather than tragic, it is perhaps even more telling. We can also listen to a first-hand witness to events surrounding the case. Dr. Van Meter is a paediatric endocrinologist who was completing his fellowship at John Hopkins and was directly involved in the treatment of the patient. Let's listen as he recounts the event. My own personal experience was one of the last cases I had in my fellowship of a little baby boy who came down from Buffalo by bus with his mom 
to Johns Hopkins to be able to be evaluated for his genitalia. He had an almost immeasurable penis and the testicles were not in the scrotum on either side. He looked kind of like externally like a female, but his chromosome analysis proved he was a boy. So we assumed from the physiology of, of genital development that the most likely cause for this was that his pituitary signaling hormones never developed. And so he did not have a, sort of the finishing off of his anatomy that happens in the third trimester of pregnancy. At the beginning of the pregnancy, the baby is um, managed, the, the genitalia are essentially constructed by placental hormones from the mom which affect the baby's testicles, create testosterone, and changes the anatomy. But if that's not finished off in the third trimester by the baby's own pituitary hormones, you end up with a baby boy that has essentially a micropenis and very small testicles that may or may not even be in the scrotum. So my attending and I went through the case and we put this child through a protocol of six weeks of fairly intensive uh, stimulation therapy using uh, human chorionic gonadotropin. Uh, which is an alternative way to get the, the testicles to, to A, respond, produce hormone, and then to see if, that, if his tissue could actually respond to his own testosterone. We sent the baby home and arranged for the child to return in six, uh, six weeks at the end of the protocol. And unbeknownst to us, we, we were very happy because we were already having problems with John Money and, and his organization within Hopkins. John Money was out of town, as far as we knew, and so he did not get a chance to get his hands on this patient. Unbeknownst to us, John Money had returned from his trip early and, without our knowledge, interviewed the patient and the mother, told the, the mother that we did not know what we were talking about with this hormonal stimulation program, that it would fail utterly, and that the child should go home and be reared as a female. So the mother, very dutifully, changed the name of her child from David to Tabitha and started putting her in a dress and announced to the family that they had a baby girl, not a baby boy. Six weeks later, the baby returns to the clinic for us to evaluate the response, and the grandmother is with the mom at this point in time, and the baby, and the baby comes back in a pink dress and an eyelet bonnet named, is named Tabitha, much to our chagrin. How did this happen? What happened? Mother explained that John Money had intervened at the last minute, interviewed them, and told her what to do. The baby had a three and a half centimeter penis and the, scrot the scrotum was full and the testicles were present. So it was, it was what we expected as, as physicians and we knew endocrinologically what should happen. We made our point, this is a very valid human being with a, a male identity both anatomically and hormonally. And so we undid Tabitha and returned David back home to Buffalo with his mother. At that point in time, John Money was not allowed to see any of the endocrine patients without explicit permission of the chief of the pediatric endocrine division. And very shortly after that, his entire operation was removed from Johns Hopkins and he was sent away in shame. So that's who we're dealing with. This is this, this kind of non-scientific thought of, I have an idea, I really want it to work, let's use children, experiment on them, and let's go from there and see what happens. There is a link to the full lecture given by Dr. Van Meter in the description box. These cases are well documented. The twin case in particular, often referred to as the John Joan case, is referenced in many articles, publications and journals. The only conclusion that a reasonable person can come to, even if one was being charitable, is that money's work was deeply flawed. It was discredited many decades ago. Yet his work, particularly in relation to the application of the affirmation treatment pathway relating to transgender treatment, has become standard practice in this field. Well, that was a potted history, but how does it relate to events affecting us today? Well, remember Kinsey's good friend and collaborator, Harry Benjamin? The Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association became the World Professional Association for Transgender Health in 1979. This organisation is often referred to by its acronym WPATH. It is the primary advocacy organisation for the transgender movement. It is well funded. Its revenue in 2016 was $1.2 million. It is highly politicised and claims to be evidence-led, but for an evidence-based organisation, it seems suspiciously slow in embracing many medical studies and papers, and appears inclined to ignore, sideline, and even campaign against clinical practitioners whose own studies appear to contradict the popular narrative. 
The majority of gender clinics and professionals dealing with transgender issues will be implementing the standards and procedures recommended by WPATH, and they do so uncritically. This should be extremely concerning because WPATH have developed their own standards of care for transgender health provision based primarily on affirmation. It was WPATH who had successfully lobbied for the changes in the DMS-5 to introduce the term gender dysphoria rather than gender identity disorder. To put it crudely, the suffering has become the diagnosis. You might have noticed by this point that a particular term has been cropping up, and that term is affirmation. What exactly does this mean, and why might it be of importance? The word itself means confirmation of a prior judgment or decision as true. Why is this of any importance? Well, simply put, it is contrary to good medical practice. Let me use an analogy. If a young girl or boy presents with an eating disorder, such as anorexia, the girl or boy is not affirmed in their perception of being overweight. The clinician will first assess their actual weight, and if the patient is extremely underweight, then they would undergo a diagnosis prior to counselling and treatment. He or she would not simply be affirmed in their belief that they are fat and then encouraged to diet. That would, I hope, be obviously wrong. Yet, in the case of gender dysphoria, that is exactly what happens in very many cases. We come to the end of this video, but we are left with many questions, which I hope to address in the third and last video on this topic. In the next video, we shall take a look at two real-world examples, because they encapsulate the issue extremely well. We shall take a look at the work of Dr. Kenneth Zucker, an authority on transgender issues, and his treatment at the hands of transgender advocates. And we will also take a look at the controversy surrounding James Scott Bradley Martin, a transgender care doctor from Ontario. <laughs>